that's one of the biggest things I find in some of the younger players coming up. They don't have those same opportunities to understand what it feels like to completely fold on a chart, like have no experience with it, sight read it and fold. Yes, it happens. <laughs> I mean, so, and you hope it, it, it happens in a rehearsal or a practice situation, <laughs> not in a live situation, right? But, but developing and understanding how to recover from that is huge. Taking yourself out of your comfort zone. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Guru's Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Bijan Watson. Bijan, well, he's a straight up beast. Originally from Boston, Bijan began his studies of classical trumpet at the prestigious New England Conservatory of Music Preparatory School. While doing his undergrad work at the University of Southern California, Bijan began his journey into the world of commercial music. Equally at home in the concert hall or arena, Bijan has made a name for himself as a versatile and dependable player who always tries to look as good on stage as he sounds. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! Welcome to another fantastic episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, and I am joined by the one and only Bijan Watson. What is up, my man? Hey, how are you? Hey, Thanks I, it's good to be here, man. Yes. Uh, I tell you, man, it, I've been wanting to get you on the on the Hang for a bit. Uh, yeah, I've been a big fan of your work, um, and uh, you know, there's so many things I want to talk with you about. And uh, let, let's 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 start with this. The, the, the you have connections with the East Coast. Yes. Originally from uh, from Boston area and the West Coast, so uh, there's the East Coast West Coast feud. We know that from, from... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 there is there has honestly always been a very distinct sound difference in my ears from East Coast to West Coast, sure. uh, and you've navigated those worlds, uh, you know seamlessly so uh what what do you see as being uh like the, the trademarks of that that goes down and the west coast down and, and what do you bring to the table it's interesting that you uh bring that up because uh i i find that because I, I went to the west coast right after high school so i was classically trained trumpet player am a classically trained trumpet player play a lot of classical music uh, New England Conservatory uh, in the preparatory school and working with uh, all those cats in the symphony and everything. And then went to USC out in LA and really started getting into more of the jazz and commercial side of things of, that I do now, uh, primarily. And uh, the West Coast sound is definitely, uh, how shall I put this? I don't want to say it's, it's not the same energy. But it's a def diff definitely a different intensity in the way uh, that a lot of the bands are approach the ensemble playing. Um, and uh, at the risk of sounding uh, elitist, it's, it's a little more polished, it seems like, in the West Coast sound in terms of, because uh, a lot more people that are, a lot of more of the artists that are in the, uh, the scene there are definitely doing more of the commercial work where they're do switching gears from jazz to classical to pop to and so there's there's a uh necessity to kind of play with a little more of a of a, of a polish on the sound um the way the writers write out there too i mean bill holman um uh that that john clayton um you know although john clayton comes from more of a bassy uh background and thad jones mel lewis type background uh, uh, let's see, who else do we have out there? Bob Kernow, you know, there's definitely that West Coast sound, which has more of a polished blend to it. So that's just the way a, a lot of the players perform. And of course, then you have bands like Gordon Goodwin, which is definitely made up of a lot of studio and uh, uh, players that are ph phenomenal, of course. And so it's just written to that that feel. Now on the East Coast, is definitely a, a raw kind of uh, vibe. Uh, a high level of intensity, um, high energy. It's just a, that's just the way it is. So um, it's interesting how the, it, the two have kind of blended over the years. 
you don't really hear that much of a distinctive nature over the, over the years, but you can in some of the, the uh, more established bands. If you listen to like Mingus and the Vanguard band versus a Clayton Hamilton jazz orchestra and a uh, 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 Gordon Goodwin uh, fat band or uh, uh, Bob Florence or, uh, you know, uh, Bill Holman big bands, they have a, they still have that thing. But now a lot of the newer bands, Monkestra is definitely has more of an East Coast edge to it. Um, so, I mean, there's there's different bands now that are coming up that have a kind of a, a, a collaboration of the two, a blending of the two uh, voices. Yeah. So, you know, for from your position, because uh, I mean, you, you do it, you do it all. I mean, you're, you're one of those one of those guys that can do it all. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, from the lead trumpet perspective, because uh, particularly because that that is, you know, that is definitely about being able to create the right vibe, you know, because you're you're, you're driving the bus, basically. Sure. So, um, do you find that you have a different approach uh, that you use on like if you're playing on the east coast band or west coast band and and what's like your personal kind of like this is this is the lane i like to be in the most <laughs> well i mean it's a good question you know i mean i one of my mentors and and teachers was Snooky young so uh i come from that school uh, i had the pleasure of sitting next to him for 14 years before he passed away in the clayton hamilton jazz orchestra and i was playing uh where i play lead trumpet to this day and, um, you know, I, when I first uh, auditioned and got into the band, um, you know, I would play a lick or I'd play a, a phrase and Snooky would tap me and say, hey, you know, why don't you play it like this? So he would sing the phrase to me. And I mean, that feedback was uh, I, I, invaluable to me. Um, and, and also, I was a student of, of the lead trumpet players in the past that were coming up to kind of you know, the Porcinos and the, you know, the, the, the uh, Falcones and, you know, those, those cats. So um, I was, I was a, I was a uh, student of those, those lead players. And what, one thing you notice is each one of them had their own sound and their own approach to how they wanted to play the book. And you have to really understand how the composer or how the band leader, what the composer wants out of the, the chart. Sometimes they want it to be a little more on top. Sometimes they want the phrasing to be a little more laid back, a la Basie, of course. Um, sometimes they want it to be um, a little more brilliant in terms of the sound. So I actually, it's interesting when I have students now that come to me and, and talk about lead playing, it's not no, necessarily about the range, but more so about the phrasing and how, how you approach that and understanding what the composers want based on each ensemble. And so you have to be a student of their music. Um, so that's how I, I approach it. Now, of course, being a lead player, that's one of the first things people hear, right? In terms of, and so you have to shape your sound to the, to the, the aesthetic of the ensemble. Um, there are a lot of fantastic lead players who oftentimes will not, are not aware of that. And so I'm just fortunate that I'm willing to, um, uh, to make those changes and, and adapt to those situations. So, um, and having an understand, but I do a lot of research on, on, a, on, a, um, well, I, with Monkestra, I was a, one of the founding members of the band. So I kind of grew with that band, but with Clayton Hamilton jazz orchestra, I did all, you know, a lot of research, listening to it, transcribing lead parts, um, Basie band. I had a, a bucket list of mine. I had a chance to sub for Frank Green uh, for a few dates in the Basie band. So, uh, of course, being a snooky young student, uh, that was that was fun as well. Um, and then, you know, when I do stuff with Michael Buble, that big band writing is different. Uh, com when composers come in. I mean, when we do sessions, oftentimes the, the trumpet section will be myself, Wayne Bergeron, Gary Grant. Dan Frenero and Chuck Finley, you know, so it's five lead players and we kind of pass it around based on what is in our wheelhouse. So it's, um, it's very, it's very cool to just be around that musicianship and make that music, but you do have to do your homework, uh, going into each ensemble. Yeah. Well, I say, I didn't realize that, that you were a protege of Snooki and Snooki yeah. has always been 
one of my favorite lead players uh, in terms of his sound yes. and his just his feel. Yeah, and, yes. it's, and and that's what I think is it, you know it's great you know when we get when we get to geek out on on Trump and hip hop, it's like you know, the 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 biggest compliment that you can get is also sometimes the worst compliment the the worst statement someone could give is mm-hmm. that they recognize you by your sound, <laughs> so <laughs> double edged sword right yeah, exactly. but Snooki Snooki had this I mean there was just something about his sound and his feel. That I mean, it's like butter. I mean, even even when he's swinging hard, even though there's, I mean, he can cut yes. through. There is a something that was just so sweet and smooth about his playing, and it seemed to me that that it, that it was part of his personality as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, Snooky started at a young age playing uh, playing on the river boats, you know, age 14, 15, playing with, you know, uh, uh, learning on, and just, he would just, he was a natural trumpet player, but he practiced every day. I mean, he's one of those guys, it's not urban legend. He practiced some level, maybe it wasn't an hour or two every day, but he practiced every day. And when I had a chance to pick him up in carpool, we carpooled to rehearsals and stuff together for several years and got to hear his story. I mean, he was focused on sound production first. And so what I tell a lot of my students is really focused on sound production and and having a nice core in your sound, no matter what the range is. I don't care if you can hit a triple C, if nobody wants to hear it or likes the quality of the sound, it doesn't really matter, does it? So <laughs> that's kind of the approach that I come from. So, um, and his core of his sound was so full. And so, so it didn't, wasn't loud necessarily, but it had such a core and breadth to it that it cut through the ensemble. And you could always tell it was his. And uh, that was something that I always aspire to, still aspire to this day. And I've been fortunate to, to attain that on, on occasion <laughs> and be called for that. But, but yes, uh, it's true. His sound was so, um, had so resonant uh, and, and in a big band setting, a lot of times it's the opposite, right? It's a little more, a little more bright or or, or focused, uh, if you will. Um, but his sound was just had a nice big breath to it, and yeah, it's a pleasure to listen to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. if if you are a, a, an aspiring lead trumpet player and you have not studied the work of Snooky, you need to get on that right away. Because check out some of his stuff with Jimmy Lunsford when he was 17, 18 years old, just. Paste, I mean, just nail, I mean, just enveloping the band with his sound is just amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And, and, and what's great, especially going back, you know, the, the showing my old age and stuff like that, because I remember <laughs> right. you know, my, my dad, my dad was a professional musician uh, for a number of years. And, uh, you know, he was he was gigging in uh, in New York during the 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot, and uh, so he was definitely hip to a lot of a lot of you know the music that was happening at that that point. And and one yeah, I was I was in the 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 Maynard Bug stage of my career at that point. You know, it's like you know that's all I was listening to is just Maynard albums. And he's like, hey, why don't you listen to some some Lunsford? And I'm like, ah, yeah, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember the first time I listened to a Jimmy Lunsford uh, recording, and I was like holy cow you know and and yeah. not only and now in retrospect you know when you start thinking about it, it's like okay well now you go into the studio and you do a session and everybody's sitting there and, and you're everybody's mic and you've got room mics and the whole nine yards and those sessions you know you might have a section mic but most of it was just right. room recording and mm-hmm. to, to hear uh the way that his sound not only it's that wonderful balance of being able to cut through yes but also to not overpower it, yes it that was just phenomenal so yeah man i, I would i certainly am, am down with that lunsford stuff so and one step further i believe that he encouraged the other ensemble members to play up to his sound as well one of the biggest compliments i get 
is when, you know, in the section says, it's so easy to play in your sound. It's so easy to get, you know, uh, into your overtone series or whatever and play. That to me is the biggest compliment, along with trombone players saying, man, it doesn't hurt me to sit in front of you. <laughs> so between those two compliments, I'm good. If I keep that coming, then, then, then we'll, we'll do that. When, when those days stop, then it's probably time for me to, to step aside for a little bit. <laughs> you know, that, that's a good, that's a, a good comment about, yeah, not, not hurting the trombone players ears. Um, I mean, I, I definitely like to hurt trombone players, but it's it has nothing to do with with sound production. It's just it, it's it's lover it's a lover hate relationship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like I remember Roger Ingram. Uh, like I, the first time I I ever did a lesson with Roger, and he's like, you know, first thing he's like, okay, you play too loud, and he's like, you know, because you're behind the bell. You know, you have to think about what are the the trombone mm -hmm. players and the sax players think about your sound. Um, and it got me thinking about that. And um, you know, what you were saying about being able to create this big sound, because I mean, you got a big sound, you know, and you have to have that to be a lead player. Uh, but it's that difference between having a rich harmonic sound, a full sound, yes. and just a loud sound. Yes. So um, how, how have you, crafted your playing you know or what are some of the, the the skills that you've had to incorporate in order to develop that kind of roundness and projection well i mean as as we play more as trumpet players as we know we go through certain we go through several uh not changes but we adapt to different situations either you know in the choice of our mouthpieces that we're using that allow us to work more efficiently or allow us to to um to be more nimble on the horn while still producing the sound that we want. So for, coming from a classical background, you know, we're always trying to get a nice full sound, maybe not projecting as much as it is in a, in a, in a um, commercial or jazz setting, but you still, you're still working on that breadth of sound and playing in a relaxed state. So if we try to, as I, I uh, try to adapt that to my jazz and commercial playing as I got, you know, which obviously has a lot more intensity, I realized that you have to still play relaxed, even, the, even when you're playing in these high intensity jazz and commercial music type situations, because you can become very inefficient with your playing if you don't, you become very tight. And, and you lose your endurance and you, and you can mess with your armature and start developing bad habits to try and muscle through, if you will, these gigs. So um, I really focus on, um, and this is where everyone has a difference of, difference of opinion, but I, I, the way I like to liken it to is I need to create a, uh, if I was to, if we were to visualize my airstream, I try and make the airstream as big and as round as possible. So yes, air in and of itself, but not necessarily taking in a big volume of air, but just efficiently creating an airstream that is big and round and allows for the most amount of, of, uh, of air speed to take place, especially I'm playing a lot more in the upper register. Um, and then the second part of that is I do a lot of um, mouthpiece buzzing and building of my embouchure, making sure the corners are secure so that I'm not um, putting too much pressure in my upper body. I'm allowing the air to flow and, and a big airstream and my chops are able to accommodate a bigger airstream and bigger uh, air uh, velocity um, when I'm playing. Trumpet geeks will probably understand that more, you know, as you play. And also equipment. Um, I've only played like maybe three different mouthpieces in my life, maybe four. Uh, I used, played on a Shilke 15 for years. Um, I never did the 14A, 4A or 14A like a lot of lead players um, do. So I've always played on kind of a, a 15, which is definitely more of a commercialist class, classical size mouthpiece. Um, I played on a one C, one and a half C, um, uh, before that. And then I played on that 15, Shoki 15 for several years. And then about 10 years ago, I went to kind of a modified three C type thing through Stomvi. It's like a, uh, but it has a different shape of a cup. 
and it's maybe closer to a 2C, you know, that right in between there. So it's a little larger, with a little d deeper cup. So, and that's the mouthpiece I pretty much play for everything. Um, unless I'm at Symphony Hall and I'm playing with a brass quintet, then I pull out the, the modified one and a half C. Um, but that has been the biggest thing is really understanding how you're creating your sound and, and visualizing what you sound, what you what your sound is and what your sound column, what your air column, uh, you want to create. Yeah. I'm sorry if that gets too esoteric, but. Oh. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's the thing is that, uh, it, you, when you're dealing with, uh, with as diverse of an audience as uh, I've tried to build here, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it doesn't matter what topic I hit on. It's like, I I'll have somebody say, man, I wish you would have talked like, you know, 15 minutes more on that. And then somebody, <laughs> say, why did you talk so much about that? <laughs> about that? Yeah. You can't win. Yeah. So <laughs> you can't win, but you know, Hey, it's my show. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there are a couple of things uh, that I want to kind of get into based on what you were just saying. And one is, uh, and this is a really controversial topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mouthpiece buzzing. Mm -hmm. I, there, there are some people that are so adamantly anti mouthpiece buzzing. And so people Interesting. Are, that are, are like, you know, huge proponents. And I mean, I'm of the camp of if it works for you, do it. Absolutely. Or yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I've always been curious about the people that are anti mouthpiece buzzing. What is the, what is the premise? Well, the, pre the, the premise is, is that it's, a, it's, it's the same as the people that are anti free buzzing that you, know, you don't use, you, you're not actually creating compression here and, and creating the buzz here. It's a, it's a result of the air column interacting with the hmm. uh, distance in the horn. And that's what actually pushes your aperture together to create the buzz and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And eh, okay. They're, yeah. They're, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I could, I, I could see that. I mean, I guess, I guess it's according to how you want to approach your sound production, right? For, for, for me, if I'm, if, if my focus is to create as big of an air column and air velocity as possible, not from, from, from my diaphragm up as opposed to my shoulders up, then I have to learn how to create that sound or create that air column by creating the air velocity from my, my diaphragm. So if I use mouthpiece buzzing as a way to put as much air velocity through Cause I don't, I don't use a tongue attack. I use an air attack for the mouthpiece buzzing. So that forces you to maintain the integrity of your corners and your embouchure. Now from a, from an, a range perspective, if you're able to have that stability in your embouchure, the more stability I feel in your embouchure and your corners you have, the more consistent of a sound you will create. If you're, if your embouchure is not stable, that's when we have imperfections in our um, our sound. That's when our sound is not as fluid or as resonant because it's not able to maintain its stability as you're creating the sound. So I'm not saying that mouthpiece buzzing is the end all be all, but it is a useful tool to understand how much air velocity is required for you to build up your embouchure to be able to sustain notes and and build endurance that's just my that's that's what's worked for me um and learn that from boyd hood and you know jimmy stamp and <laughs> i guess that I, I would like to think that they have an idea of what works <laughs> i would like to think that you know but i'm not saying that's a be all end all but but that i found that that is if i'm trying to get back on track and i'm and i'm uh, you know, I'm trying to focus my chops and everything like that. The mouthpiece buzzing is the best way to kind of give me a litmus test as far as how my chops are responding, how everything's working. It's not about compression at that point. It's just about corner integrity, embouchure strength, embouchure flexibility. So, yeah. um, and the free buzzing too has its merits as well. I mean, there's definitely, I, I feel there's definitely, um, so use for, I don't personally, do free buzzing, uh, maybe I should, I don't know, but it, it's, 
you, you have to de- it, it, whatever you do, you have to develop a routine, like you said, that works for you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's very easy to jump, right? I mean, jump around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and you know that that's, uh, I guess maybe one of the hardest things is. Uh, when something doesn't work, it becomes a question of does it work because it's the wrong thing, or mm. that it's the wrong approach that you're using towards it, or you haven't done it enough, or you did it too much. So there are all these variables, you know. But but it, it I I think that that you have if you want to try something, um, that we should we should have the freedom to try it, which is one of the reasons why I like asking these kind of questions because. You know, there, there's some there's some young trumpet player out there in the world mm-hmm. right now that's watching this episode who has either never heard about mouthpiece buzzing or who has a teacher who is so adamantly against it that, you know, that they, they, they have developed a fear for it. And it may be something that is beneficial for them. So, you know, when they can hear... Uh, a, a highly successful player being able to say, "This is how this is how I approach it. This is why I do the. This is these are the you know the strategies that I have, and these are the suggestions I have." Then they can take that and play with it, and then you know figure out whether it is something that's going to be beneficial. But if they never get exposed to it, or they never right. get exposed to the the correct principles behind it, then they're missing out on something that could potentially help them to become, you know, the best version of themselves. And you bring up a good point, Jose. It's like, I don't mind if someone disagrees with something. I I just, just, I'm willing to listen, but have a, have a reason, have some reasoning behind it or tell me why it didn't work for you. And that's where a lot of times there's a lot of amazing players out there, not just on trumpet, but in, in, you know, um, that really can't haven't taken time to quantize what it is, how, how they got to where they are. And, and that's one of the things I've been fortunate as, a, as an educator, you know, to really sit down and, and, and take some time and think about why this works for me. Because that's the biggest thing, right? Explain to me why it works. And, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying it's going to work for you. But here's something to try. Maybe a modified version of it will work for you. But um, so, yeah, to your point, yes, uh, it's important to have these concepts. I mean, I wasn't even hip to uh, Chickowitz's book until M- Mike hooked me up with it, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, I could see. Yeah. And so I started incorporating that into my warm up and it helped, that, you know, but that was well into my career that I, uh, you know, but, you know, you have to understand how something might help you or not help you before you can adopt it, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it. I w- I'm reading a book right now um, that's about the, uh, dealing with uh, complex problems. And it's and, and they're, the authors are talking about the difference between something that is complicated and something that's complex, and that there's a, there's a difference. Complicated means that there's a linear progression and you know it just maybe takes a little more skill or a little more time to to deal with it or a little more tension and complex is a variety of interacting components that mm. create, uh that, that they interact on a level that uh, that a shift in one creates a shift in others it's actually mm-hmm. more like a holistic system yes yes mm-hmm. system um but trumpet playing is, is both complicated. I mean, there's certainly there's a level yes. of complication, but then there's all of these complexities that go into, uh, you know, you start doing things like, uh, you know, changing your gear, uh, changing, you know, it, health changes, you know, if you absolutely lose weight, if you're hydrated, if you're dehydrated, all of these things create a, a subtle effect in the system. And what you're saying about being able to quantize things, uh, you know, having that, uh, you know, some people just hit it naturally. You know, it's like they're, mm-hmm. they're thinking about what they're doing, uh, which is <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> I got to think about some stuff. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, but even then, uh, you know, I'll, uh, yeah, every great player that I've talked to that says that you know they were a natural at the beginning uh, always then says at some point in my career I hit a block. And I had to figure out what I'm doing and how I'm doing it in order mm-hmm. to fix it. So the, I think the earlier you can get onto that 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 stage of being analytical about your playing, I mean, not over analyzing, yeah. but analytical right. 
in what you do, what works, when it works, why it doesn't work, uh, the better off you're going to be in your long-term progress. So like when you're saying, okay, you're, you weren't an, you, you're not that guy. You're not that guy that everything is just, you know, supernatural. You have to think about it. Um, so how, how did you approach, uh, like your development of, of your concept of playing, you know, from the, you know, uh, being able to to quantize the things that you need to be able to do to be the most effective and efficient player possible. Well, it, you know, it, it kind of stems from the material that I, that I was required or asked to p- perform. Um, you know, originally it was it was all classical material growing up in high school primarily, and I, we had a high school band, we did a little bit of jazz, big band stuff, but I would not consider myself a lead player at that point in high school. I really didn't kind of get into the lead playing um, uh, tendencies <laughs> until like college. Um, that's where my range started to expand. Um, and so really as a result of the different things I was asked to perform, I said, okay, I need to develop a method that's going to allow me to be a chameleon. I love playing salsa. I love playing quintet music. I love playing in a wind ensemble. I love playing. So what is what is happening in those different situations? What what needs to happen in those situations and my approach to the horn and my equipment too. That's when I learned a lot about my equipment. Um, you know, maybe maybe my uh, uh, Storm V uh, titanium bell is not right for the brass quintet <laughs> at the symphony hall. Maybe I need to go back to my, you know, my Bach 37 um, for that type of stuff. So but figuring that out and then understanding ultimately that, you know, you can't have a horn for every situation. You need to be able to find some pieces of equipment that work over a wide range of, of, and then you have to work on how you approach your sound. So really for me, it was a byproduct of the the gigs that I was getting called to do and, and, and spending time, I mean, hours spending time, okay, how am I approaching this attack? How am I, I'm recording myself uh, playing these different things. When I was asked to go on tour um, with Eric Benet and Carl Thomas which was a pop gig back, uh, you know, I had, I couldn't approach it the same way as I was a, a classical gig or doing a wind ensemble thing. I had to say, okay, what, what horn's going to work for this? Uh, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of switching mouthpieces. So is it the horn? Is it going to be a slight change in my mouthpieces? You know, how am I approaching these things? So it's really having a, a, a vision, not a vision for your sound, but ha- having a, 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 an idea orally of what you want your sound to be and, and spending time recording yourself, um, understanding how you want to get there and spending time working on that. I mean, we can talk to, you know, anyone like Wayne uh, Bergeron, for example. I mean, there's subtle changes that we make in our horns to accommodate where we are in our playing as well. Our playing, you know, as you get a little longer in the tooth, you don't have that same endurance uh, and ability to, to, you know, you have to have find a setup that's a little more efficient um, for you. So, but you only can do that if you understand how you're uh, performing. So yeah. I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really cool. I mean, there, because there's so many things to think about. I mean, we can certainly go crazy thinking about it. And I think that sometimes, yeah, that's mm-hmm. the problem is that, you know, yes. we're, we're always told, you know, uh, no, yeah, don't don't think about this too much, just play. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you also need to have, I, I think to get the best results, you do need to have a level of understanding or at least have resources that can help you with those things. Um, and as you're talking about Stomby, uh, just recently uh, had a hang with uh, KO. From mm-hmm. Stomby, and, you know, he's one of those dudes that can cannot just say, oh, here, try this horn, but yeah. we'll be able to tell you why that horn, you know, why this one might work better for you than this right. one and give you, give you some, some, uh, guidelines to work with. And yeah, ultimately it does come down to what feels good and sounds good. Sure. But you know, when you understand the, the science behind things, the mechanics, the theories behind things, then at least kind of starts pointing you in the right, in the right direction. direction. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's some super cool stuff. Um, you know, one of the things I did want to uh, talk to you about, and this is, uh, 
and this is kind of one of my personal things that that I do like to talk with with players about, particularly uh, players of uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, so, you know, when you see, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, like I, I think about some of the great league players that you used know, to look at in the, you know, the old, you know, like, okay, well, Bill Chase, you know, Bill Chase got those tiny little, little wafer lips, you know, it's like, and, you know, so how does a guy with big lips, you know, mm -hmm. play the horn and play, you know, especially, you know, playing in the upper register, playing with good sound. And, you know, I, so mm -hmm. I have had personal conversations with people because, you know, I got sure. Myself, but you know, it's one of the things I do like to ask on the show when I have people on because there are a lot of people that are be you know they're being told well because you have you know flesh in your lips uh, that you know you need to play this kind of mouthpiece or you're never going to get sure. this kind of sound or things like that which I I just think is all bullshit yeah so, uh, you know so how do you uh, you know how do you deal with, you know, having flesh of your lips? You know, how does that, you know, how do you see that as being an advantage to you? How do you see it as being a disadvantage and how do you make it work for you? It's very interesting. You know, I mean, I, it, I, it's one of those things I hadn't really thought about until, until I started teaching more private students, you know, I, I got into my career and I was teaching more privately and, you know, all ethnic backgrounds, male, female, you know, um, and noticing like, oh, well, uh, I'd have a younger younger student that had less fleshy lips, you know, thinner lips, as it were. And they wanted to play on kind of, uh, you know, they wanted to come in with a lead mouthpiece, uh, a lead mouthpiece, you know, very shallow, you know, and, and it works in the upper register, but doesn't sound good in any other register. <laughs> and they would say, well, I just figured because, uh, you know, I had uh, more less fleshy lips, I would use this. I said, well, the the... I believe ultimately when we just talk about our, our chops and, and, and our physically the skin area here around your armature, I mean, it's funny, you have the, I see you have the Robinson's remedy there. I, I, I use that as well. I mean, that's, that's a big thing. Inflammation is huge in your chops, um, especially the way we use in the, in the smaller area that's compressed against the way you control the inflammation can change based on your, the size of your lips, based on the the uh, pliability of your lips, I feel that you should always keep your chops as pliable as possible. I mean, I hear stories sometimes from play, younger players, oh, my lip split and this, that, and the other. It's like, well, were they dry? Were they chapped? Were, were you drinking enough water? Were you hydrated? Um, you know, for years we go through different stages. I used to put Carmex on my lips back when I was in college. And I used to put, uh, uh, used to take uh, aspirin, right, to help with swelling and things like that. And now I don't use any of those things. The only thing I put on my chops right now is Robinson's Remedy, which is a, definitely more of a natural thing, which helps with that inflammation, right, and helps with the hydration of your chops. I drink gallons of water a day. Now I'm a bigger guy, but I, I drink a minimum of a gallon, probably closer to two gallons of water a day, which is huge. And then when I'm playing, guys make fun of me because like I have gallons of water, on the, you know, and I'm literally have a gallon jug. Um, and so uh, I find that really it doesn't matter how fleshy they are. It just matters the amount of hydration and pliability that you have. Now, you know, I can't speak to people that have less fleshy lips <laughs> uh, to that. But what I can say is that having taught several students that have had a wide range of size, that was never an issue. It was more of an issue of whether the lips were pliable, whether they were dealing with excessive inflammation in their chops, what were they doing to take care of their chops after playing, and the recovery time of it. And also their approach. If they're doing too much inward pressure, then you see um, a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, players have, uh, uh, have damaged their, their armature area. So, there's a lot of factors, right? It's complex, as it were. <laughs> uh, a lot of factors that go into, regardless of the size of your, uh, or, or the, 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 the volume of your, your lips and armature that go into that. Um, and the biggest thing is hydration and pliability. So the more time you spend on that, the more success I believe you'll have in maintaining consistency in the size of your armature as you're playing. 
right? If it swells up, you have swelling, I don't care if your lips are thin or big or whatever, then you're going to have a problem. So I think it comes down to uh, maintaining a level of consistency in your chops and the size of your chops so that you can find the right mouthpiece that works for you. Yeah. Because ultimately the volume of your of lip that goes into the mouthpiece is going to be the same whether your lips are big or small because it's, it's, it's right here. Yeah. So whether you have small lips or big lips, I'm not using the outside of my lips to play. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm using this area and that changes each person has a, still the still it's still the same surface area ultimately right yeah, yeah whether you have thin lips or big lips so so we're not we're not playing like this <laughs> so <laughs> some people do uh, <laughs> many of us don't play like that <laughs> yeah but you know it, it successfully successfully exactly there, 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 <laughs> that's your point uh, but you know the 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 thing about uh like the, the i guess some some of the, the the fallacies in you know i think they're they're well intentioned but the you know they're still not particularly truth uh like okay, well have, it's not based it's not based in an applied practice right right it's just not yeah so, I mean, it's like the thing, okay, well, if you have bigger lips, you need to play a bigger mouthpiece. Okay, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you have smaller lips, doesn't mean you play a smaller mouthpiece. Oh. Uh, it, but but it's the, uh, it's interesting because of like design. Um, you know, I always felt like I had to play a bigger mouthpiece. Uh, for years, I was playing, mm. um, I was playing a Shoki 16. Okay, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, so I played a 16 C4 for, mm -hmm. you know, general playing and then, for league playing it was a 16a okay uh, okay but you know that's that's still a stinking huge mouthpiece it's huge yeah and, yeah and i've over the years gone to a smaller mouthpiece and now i'm playing a really fairly small diameter and small volume mouthpiece uh and i didn't think i was going to be able to to play it but uh doug mcveigh the manufacturer said mm. well the reason that you're not that you yes yeah, you know doug I, I can't believe that this mouthpiece is allowing me to play without I, because i always have so much trouble with lip intrusion and he goes the problem wasn't that the mouthpiece was too small it was the the way that the the rim transition yes that's that yes that, go ahead yeah keep going i know where you're going yes yes the, the, the with the other mouthpieces the rim the the shape of the the rim yes. alpha angle was actually drawing my lips into the cup which made me bottom out consistently interesting interesting and, you know, yes like oh okay well you know man it, i really believe that every college music program should have a course on equipment and like absolutely design it what how it's designed why it's designed that way what are the yep. you know the i totally agree i totally agree and to your point i think that's what because like i for years i was like right, i don't play a 3c i don't play a 3c no 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 no. and then ko sat me down and said all right relax this is this has a it's kind of like a 3c but it's got the shape of the rim and the cup is a little modified and the 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 angle at which the the cup, you know, all those little minute things change, you know, those little uh, complexities, as you were, changes how the response of the horn is. And, and how the horn responds and how, I was like, whoa, I was blown away. I would never, but if I had just gone, because, you know, we didn't have those that many choices when we were coming up. It was either what, Bach, Schilke, who else was making mouthpieces then? Um, Stork, uh, Stork. I mean, it, it depends. I mean, if you were like a general, if you were like well, a, coming up in the classical vein, it was either Bach or Schilke, really. Yeah, I yeah, mean, that, that, was that was pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. Back in the seventies, eighties, you know. Unless yeah. you're going to, you know, go someplace, it, you know, to a, a custom shop. So if you're on the East Coast, you couldn't get Bob Reeves mouthpieces. It was really oh. hard to come by. You know, you could maybe get a Jardinelli. Yeah, but, uh, the Jardinelli. So, that's the other one I was thinking. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it's like you know now there's there's a plethora of, of mouthpiece manufacturers out there, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, you 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 had limited you had limited availability because you went to your local store and all they probably carried was Bach and Shoki. Uh, and back then they messed with the backboards more. That was the big thing is messing. And I went down, I tried went down a rabbit hole with that, and 
stepped away because I was like, oh, this is not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, yeah. You just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you, you can go nuts on any of those things. Uh, but yeah, okay, so like with the classical thing, like, you know, going through starting, starting mm -hmm. out as, as a, a, I hate using this word, but I do use all. I know, it's all right. A legit, legit, player. yeah, legitimate player, yes, yeah. as opposed to an illegitimate player. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but but going from the classical realm, you know, and then transitioning into the you know the jazz and the commercial commercial side of thing, um, I, yeah, I will be honest, I I'm probably one of the world's worst classical players. Uh, just just uh, I don't know why, but uh, I know why because I just haven't spent enough time doing it. Uh, but um, you know how how. There, there are two things that I see in terms of the transition between uh, classical music and 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 jazz and and uh, commercial music. Um, the there's a slightly different sound concept, mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously uh, some of the the requirements in terms of uh, your yeah your range uh, your absolutely improvisational yes. and and flex the improvisational both in terms of uh, free improv, meaning soloing, and then your interpretation, your ability to interpret right. things freely. Um, you have a little more freedom in the in the jazz world than you do in the the legit world. Absolutely. So, um, you know how how did you kind of navigate that that transition? What are what are some of the things that that kind of led you along that path? And and uh, you know how how did your your jazz how did your legit playing your classical playing help your your commercial playing and then vice versa how is your uh the experiences you've had in the, the jazz and commercial world how have they perhaps benefited your classical playing well i mean from a from a classical standpoint where just learning uh getting gaining proficiency on the instrument and understanding how to navigate around the instrument understanding how to navigate uh articulation wise and, and really understanding the mechanics i think that's where the biggest uh, upside of of having being classically trained um and developing a level of consistency um uh, especially when you get into the commercial side of things and you're doing you know going in the studio i mean it's all about they may ask you to do 20 takes of of tune and you've got to play it exactly the same or have a concept of how you're going to approach it um every single time that's that's uh, relatively consistent or else, you know, you're going to be there all day. Um, so that's the biggest thing I think going over from bringing from the classical side to the jazz and commercial side is this level of consistency and uh, uh, in terms of consi consistency in terms of intonation, consistency in terms of our uh, approaching articulations, understanding how to create them. Um, now from going the other direction, Jazz, from a jazz to uh, to the classical side of things, I think <clears throat> it's according to what position you're in. A lot of times, because like when I was on tour with Natalie Cole, and we would play with an orchestra, it'd be like a big band within an orchestra type situation. And so it was kind of a hybrid situation. Or I've done some things with Diana Krall, the LA Phil and stuff like that, where you know, it's awesome being in a section with Tom Hooten and, <laughs> and Rob, Rob Shear, you know, and Tom's like, uh, yeah, you're playing this. <laughs> you know? So my role is different in those situations. I'm not the principal trumpet playing the classically, you know, uh, classical stuff. But um, so my role then is to uh, match the sound um, of Tom or, or Rob Shear or whoever's playing the principal part at that point. Um, if I'm the one playing the principal part in a, in a pop type situation, usually um, then I can take a little more li a little more liberty with the phrasing. We can talk about how we're going to approach stuff. Maybe we can play a little better volume. It's according to who's conducting too. Some conductors don't want to hear a whole bunch of brass, regardless of whether it's called for it. So it's understanding all those different elements about what uh, what the director wants what is required of you in the section. Um, so that's where I feel the, the jazz and commercial side of things, understanding how to play in those elements allows me to adapt better to different situations. Whereas a lot of classical players or legit players that haven't had an opportunity to do much jazz or commercial music, they're still approaching that music with the same articulation and that mindset and that uh, sound production 
Um, not thinking about projecting the sound as much, maybe, you know, so there, there's, it's, it's really, it, it's really understanding what is required of you in each setting. And that just takes time. And now I'm not saying I could, I would be able to jump in and play principal trumpet in the Chicago or anything like that. That's a level of consistency that requires hours and hours. And, you know, I mean, a commitment to that. But I would submit that those same people would not want to sit and play a whole night on American Idol playing lead trumpet and be that exposed. <laughs> I don't think, you know, um, on B flat trumpet, no, no less. Right. That's the other thing, too. You know, a lot of times when I'm doing it, sometimes I, I, I have to bring my C out. They don't want me to bring my B flat. I got to play on C trumpet the whole time, which is a completely different approach in and of itself. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting, man. It's pretty interesting. Uh, being able to switch between the two. But I've been fortunate to be patient enough to and be willing to make those changes because you have to be willing to kind of uh, make those changes in your playing and your approach if you want to blend in both worlds. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and it's kind of, uh, yeah, you've got the, the classical world, you've got the jazz commercial world. Um, but even, even without, uh, w within them, you can kind of break down into like, okay, well, uh, yeah, you've got orchestral playing, you've got mm -hmm. quintet playing, you have, uh, you know, your principal or you're a mm -hmm. soloist. Um, and then, you know, in, in, in the jazz and commercial world, we have other things too. So, you know, you, you've been able to do not only both main categories of, of music or three categories, if you want to put it mm -hmm. that way. Uh, but then you've also done uh, over your career, you've been uh, successful in the studio, you've been successful on tour, you've been in television and uh, things like that. So um, what is your favorite venue? Mm -hmm. Well, that has changed a lot over the years, too. I mean, if you were to ask me what my dream gig was, I mean, you know, Doc Severinsen being out in front of the Tonight Show band was the reason why I wanted to continue to, you know, I said, I want to be able one day to do that. And so I love being a guest artist in front of uh, big bands, uh, wind ensembles. I've been doing stuff with wind ensembles, which is pretty cool. Some classical and commercial type stuff, which has been fun. Um, but really, I mean, uh, you know, I love playing in a big band. There's no, there's no greater feeling than playing lead trumpet in, in, a, in a great big band. Um, uh, you know, I have a huge, I'm a huge fan, a close second to Latin music. I have my own Latin ensemble, um, the Latin jazz syndicate. And, uh, I just love that, love that music. Grow up listening to Iraquere and Bambaleo and Los Bonbon. And, you know, I just love all that stuff. So, um, a huge fan of that but you know at this stage of my career uh I, I definitely enjoy the big band playing in the big band and just just unfortunately there's so few opportunities to do that um at a high level uh anymore other than reading you know reading bands or i'm fortunate to be in clayton hamilton jazz orchestra and do stuff with the monkestra and things like that but uh yeah big band but i i, I really enjoy being out in front i mean i i love uh playing with a great ensemble and and doing that. So that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, well, that's cool. I mean, because it's, it's like uh, if you're if you're playing in the big band, you know, you're 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 pushing the band because you're in the back. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you're going this way. Uh, if, if you're in the front, then sometimes you feel like you're pulling the band. Yeah, you know, that's true. I, I put the band on my back like a stack of potatoes sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that happens. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, those those different situations that there's those those little subtle mind shifts that have to occur uh, mm -hmm. and, and changes you know, going to change the approach of your playing, you know, based on on those situations. Um, so, yeah, you know, like you were talking about, like you know, American Idol and things like that. So you you know, mm -hmm. you've done tons of you've done live TV hits and things like that. Yeah. Um, is there a perceptible? Uh, change in the you know the pressure. <laughs> where are you going where are you going with this <laughs> <laughs> yeah a perceptible change in the the feeling of pressure in that kind of a gig as opposed to you know doing a uh, doing a hit with natalie cole um yes you know the whole tv 
Well, I, I would say this. Okay, so the three different venues, uh, you know, whether it's on TV, whether it's in the recording studio, or whether it's live performance, right? So with, with live performance, um, the vast majority of the time you're playing with an ensemble that you've Record, you know, rehearsed with for a good period of time. So there's a little less pressure. You just really want to make sure that you're consistent and giving giving the composer or the, the artist what they what they want from you. You know, you realize when you get to a certain level that those artists call you for a particular reason. They like the way you, you work with them. They like your sound. They like the, you know, energy you bring to it. So there's a lot, little less pressure in that regard. The TV situation, we rehearse that so much before we get on for that minute and a half, two minutes of playing, usually in the horn, I mean, it's it, we're automatic by that point. So there's really not much, um, you know, you, you don't have to worry, or at least I don't feel as like we've rehearsed it enough. We're going to get that, you know. It's really in the recording studio, like um, like when we were recording uh, Secret Life of Pets, and uh, Dan Frenero was playing lead on that. Phenomenal, did a phenomenal job. I was playing. Uh, second or third, I can't remember what I was playing, Rob Shear and then Kai Palmer uh, on a few of the sessions. It was, it was like a whole week long of, of sessions, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, the, you know, Alexander Desplat was up there and he could hear everything. So that's when you kind of get into you're like, OK, we got to make sure we play this consistently every single time uh, nails because uh, then they might want to change something slightly. OK, change this articulation here. Change, and you still had to go back and do it. You know, over and over again. And there was some, there was some heat in some of those parts, and Dan did a fantastic job of uh, of playing that. But a lot of stuff was unison up there, and that's what he wanted to hear. It doesn't, you know, sometimes we'll split it up. Once someone will take the octave, someone will take, you know, he's like, no, I want to hear everyone up there, you know, that type of thing. So, it, you know, so that that puts a different amount of play, pressure when you're at Capitol Studios and you're in a, you know, twenty piece big band with Peter Erskine on drums and etc. and everyone's waiting on you you don't want to be the you don't want to be the guy yeah. you know the, the, <laughs> you don't want to be that guy um uh or that person excuse me um that person yes that is uh you don't want to be that person that's going to uh, slow things down so that there's a little more pressure in those situations i feel or you know if i'm doing some michael buble in this in the session there we want to get it right you know um and we want the art and the artist is sitting right there in the in the uh and a lot of times he'll be in the studio recording scratch tracks uh audio scratch tracks uh, vocal scratch tracks while we're um performing and sometimes he uses those tracks uh those vocal tracks uh and so you know goes back to consistency so that i think i think that's where preparation meeting opportunity meeting you know success is where it all comes together if you don't prepare you can't cram for something like that yeah. You know, you have to be um, ready to go in and, and play at a high level several times consistently. So, well, and yeah. I still I still work on things. I mean, you know, like I said, as you get older, you know, like I'm making sure my accuracy and my range, my upper register is still intact, you know, because um, that changes too as your body changes, as your level of fitness changes, as you know, those type of things. You got to keep those things up. And uh, you can get away with it when you're younger, but as you get a little more mature, you can't get away with a lot of those things. So it's being aware, I think, you know, cool. self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, I, actually that, that brings up a, a, a good question, or at least I think it's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody talks about consistency, right? You have to become consistent, you have to be consistent. Okay, well, how do you become consistent? How do you practice? What are, what are the things that you need to do uh, and from a teacher's perspective, hmm. what are the things that, that you suggest people do and how do they approach those things to develop the kind of consistency that you're talking about? Well, you know, the biggest challenge now, you know, I, coming up in Los Angeles after moving from Boston to Los Angeles, there were there were big bands, there were reading bands at, you know, I mean, several. And, and the, there's no substitute for just experience, right? There's no substitute for just performing whether it's in a rehearsal type band type it's there's no substitute for seeing this music come across your stand and you're playing it and performing it and falling on your face and being forced to go home and practice it later you know there's no substitute for that so um that's one of the biggest things i find in some of the younger players coming up they don't have those same opportunities to understand what it feels like to completely fold on a chart 
like have no experience with it, sight read it and fold. Yes, it happens. <laughs> I mean, so, and you hope it, it, it happens in a rehearsal or a practice situation, <laughs> not in a live situation, right? But, but developing and understanding how to recover from that is huge. Taking yourself out of your comfort zone. I, I'll pull out, I'll pull out some Charlie A etudes every now and then and dig into those to get back my consistency. I'll pull out, um, and also it's according to what I'm working on. Like if I, like, for example, I'm about to teach a jazz camp at University of Nebraska, Omaha in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to be, there's going to be a pro band um, where the faculty, all the faculty get together and perform. And then I'm conducting the college band and there's seven other big bands, you know, so of varying levels. So getting ready to prepare that music, I want to be able to play that music, you know, the charts that I pick out, I want to make sure I, I'm familiar with them. Either I've played them or, um, you know, I've wanted to play them. So I'm going to be practicing that music just as much as the the, the, uh, the uh, youth in the band are. Um, but you have to develop a routine that allows for you to understand where your chops are at and understand what your weaknesses are. You cannot be afraid to work on your weaknesses. For the longest time, I had, I had to get... Triple tonguing was a was a, I mean I could triple tongue enough like when I was in when I was growing up in high school um, we played Scheherazade in the Greater Boston Yosemite you know I had to learn I had to learn how to triple tongue I had never done it before and if you don't practice that when it comes back to time to do it then you can fail miserably so it's it's understanding based on the material that I'm about to prepare or I need to prepare for, okay, what are some of the, the weaknesses that I need to, and then I need to pull out the book, I need to pull out the method books and get back to work, get back to basics. It's, it's really that simple um, because it's not something that you, like I said, you can cram. You can't learn how to triple tongue overnight. That's a, you know, or I'm just using it as an example or double tongue or whatever. So I spent a lot of time putting my calendar together what I'm gonna be practicing. Um, I have people that call me to put to put together um, recordings for big bands, you know, play lead trumpet record in my house. So what does that look like? You know, what, you know, I got to prepare that for. So as you start to prepare more music, you find out what your weaknesses are and your strengths and you focus on those and, and, and get better. And, and then over, over time, you build up a breadth of experience where there's very few things I haven't seen now in terms of patterns and articulations and understanding how composers want things approach band leaders want to approach things so that's what you that's what you build that's why you can be a phenomenal player at a young age but it doesn't mean that you have the experience necessary to play at a high level unless you've had those opportunities sorry for the long-winded answer Jose. oh no 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 that, that, that's great uh yeah i i think that yeah that there's sometimes there are so many things that we take for granted and maybe it's you know some of it's just human nature where where once we understand something you know we have a level of mastery on it we're always looking at it from our perspective and we sometimes fail to, to understand that you know there's a point in our lives where we had no idea what the hell anybody was talking about yeah when we talk about things like uh consistency when we talk about things like accuracy we talk about concepts like you know when we talk about breath or sound or any any concept that that, that has to be developed um you know there are people that that really don't have a grasp on either a what it is or b how to get how to to systematically uh develop those skills and so talking with you know someone like yourself who's got such you know experience along the breadth of being a, a professional trumpet player, uh, I think it's really important to kind of get those definitions and get those uh, practical tips on how do I, you know, how do I accomplish it? You know? Well, it's very easy to fall, I, 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 to your point, it's very easy to fall into a false sense of security with your play. It's like, oh, well, I sounded great on that album. I, I'm, <laughs> I must be, uh, you know, I don't need to work on that anymore. No, that's not the case at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We change over time. A trumpet's a very psychosomatic instrument, right? Um, and, uh, you know, our, our face changes. Our, the, 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 
um, the the muscles in our, our face change. You know, they're, they're you know our, the the pliability of our, our skin changes, things like that. Um, uh, cardiovascular, uh, especially for the trumpet, you got to think about that. Um, being able to maintain that high level of you know your if you look at your watch, you know, we have the we have the technology now to see our our heart rate as we're playing. Right? I mean, it, there's some serious stuff going on there. Playing the trumpet is a workout, literally, um, or can be right. Um, cause you're, you know, your heart rate is elevated. You're, you know, you're expelling, uh, carbon dioxide and, 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 um, uh, uh, moisture. I, I mean, so you, as you get older, as you progress and you're playing, things will change and you have to be aware of those, make yourself aware of those. And you, you have to be self-aware and you can't keep practicing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, that you're good at, you need to practice the stuff that you're not good at. And that only comes from getting your butt handed to you a few times, um, and uh, to the point where you know I've I've put big bands together. So hey, I got a show coming up. I need to practice this chart. Let's let's put a band together and let's just play, you know. And because there's also no substitute, you can sit in your room and practice the lead trumpet part by yourself to the cows come home, but that doesn't help you understand how the rest of, what the rest of the players in your section need. The other elements, uh, what's going on from the uh, uh, the other parts in the band, you know, articulations, phrasings, and things like that. So there's really there's there's yes, you might get it note perfect, but you won't necessarily get it performance level perfect. So. Right, right. Well, and you know, you, you made a really interesting point, and it, it just made me think about this uh, because uh, you you talked uh, earlier about you know having uh, like your you're doing your mouthpiece buzzing and stuff like that. And things on your website, you have uh, some warm up, some concepts about warm up and things like mm. that. And on, on your website, you do talk about the importance of having a consistent warm up. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, every, every working professional has a consistent warm up. So we need to have some level of consistency where and everyone's, everyone's warm up is different too. Right. I mean Right. Yeah, absolutely. But it's the thing of like, you need the consistency, mm -hmm. but if you don't have variety. Right. You know, so, so it's finding that, that balance of don't just a, a pro, don't have a shotgun approach to your, your practice, have a, have a very clear and decisive warm up to establish things, but then have this portion where you're doing things outside your comfort zone. Right. So do you, do you have like a, I, I call this book ending where I have uh, concepts where it's like, okay, I want to start with, with, some, with a known, I want to end with a known, and then in the middle is where I can kind of. Sure. I mean, you know, so what I tell a lot of my students, I have a, I have a, like a 15 to 20 minute get ready for a performance warm up, And then I have the warm up which tests the breadth of my, of, <laughs> of my playing when I need to play, whether that's um flexibility in my chops range sound production um so 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 to me your warm-up should cover or should give you a litmus test or a baseline for where you're at for the day um in three areas flexibility sound production and range for me for range because most of the time i'm getting called to play lead trumpets type stuff so i need to make sure that stuff is firing in the right in the right register and feels feels right. So um, if you have a concept of what you want to accomplish, so my book end is flexibility, and then it goes to range, I end with range stuff. Um, and then in between it's sound production, I, I would like to think that if I've consistently have an idea of what my sound is, then flexibility will lead to the will cover the sound production while I'm doing it. And then I'll be able to see the range after my flexibility and sound production is in place. Then I can see where my range is at in my warm up. So I, um, I start with mouthpiece buzzing very briefly, like maybe like a minute, just to see how the, my pliability of my chops and air speed, get my air column set. And then I'll do uh, stamp exercises um through all 12 keys uh, with slurs and attacks on scales and stuff like that and then i'll do our arpeggiated uh um octaves in range 
starting from low C all the way up to double C. Um, and so then I'll know, uh, sometimes I won't go up to double C, it's according to what I'm playing, how much I'm playing, but at least up to an A, uh, A double A above the staff. So, um, and that takes about 15 to 20 minutes. The elongated one involves more flexibility. So I'll spend some time with either uh, the Belk um, book, me Belk method book, or Flexus, I'll do some of that. Um, and then I will hit a excerpt of a of a uh, etude, Charlie A etude, or I will hit an excerpt of a, a jazz etude. Bob McChesney wrote these jazz etudes. I don't know if you're hip to trombone player. And then I will spend a great deal of time with a tuner and a metronome um, doing my arpeggiated range exercises. Um, and that that will take about forty five minutes to an hour. So that's the that's the longer uh, warm up that I'll do, um, and then I'll always finish the show with long tones and uh, pedal tones, about fifteen minutes, ten to fifteen minutes. So that's pretty much what I. Do. That's the abridged version. <laughs> abridged version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's. I, I mean, like I said, I only do the. I mean, I really only warm up about fifteen or twenty minutes prior to playing a gig. Right. I don't spend. I don't spend. Um, now, my <laughs> colleague Sean Jones, who uh, man, that's a bad dude. Um, I've been in the room next to that cat, and his his he he can go for about an hour, hour and fifteen. But hey, I ain't mad at him. He's all over that horn. Yeah. Yeah, I can play anything. Okay. So. Yeah, Sean's a real deal, man. Yeah, he's a real deal. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, I think that the the first person that 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 kind of said this to me was uh, Vaughn Nark. And Vaughn mm -hmm. was saying like, um, you know, a lot of guys leave their best playing in the in in the warm up. You know, like in the practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, yeah, you've got to find the efficient warm up for yeah. you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and just talking and he, and he was talking about this, uh, also the psychological dependency that we we get on the warm up. And obviously, from a physiological perspective, uh, like you're saying about, you know, body change and stuff like that, when you're when you're younger, you can maybe get away with not doing as much, um, mm -hmm. you know, as you get older, uh, you know, the recovery period sure you know your, your your refractory period uh so you may need to adapt uh, a little bit differently and you know also uh weather wise like you know if you're if you're playing like for for the the, the guys that are playing like a lot of outdoor gigs outdoor gigs huge difference huge know, difference yeah so you're you're having having a base of what you want to cover uh being able to uh change it based on the circumstances but um you know, not not becoming so. I think sometimes we get so beholden to it and feel like, oh, if I don't do my two and a half hours of warm up before the gig, I'm not going to be able to play. Um, you well, know, so I would submit. I would submit that if I bet if you were to ask Wayne or Dan or any of the other guys that do a lot of the commercial stuff, they don't spend two. Hours, they they don't have the time to spend two hours warming up. It's probably a half hour for I and I don't want to speak for them, but I would just imagine just based on what the schedule is and and the demands of what you're going to be asked to play during the session, you can't spend two hours warming up. <laughs> it's just that's just kind of productive. Now, when you're practice sessions, that's that's something completely different. But when we're talking about warming up prior to doing a gig or a performance or a recording, you don't have that. You, yeah, you don't have that luxury. Yeah. So that's cool. I mean, I love mm -hmm. it. And I certainly, man, there's so many, there are so many discussions we could get into. Uh, but uh, I know we've got to start wrapping things up here shortly. And mm -hmm. I've got three segments that we got to get through. Okay, and, let's do it. Uh, first one is uh, our uh, sound off segment brought to us by uh, my good friend, Michael Barkley of Barkley Microphones. Uh, if you haven't checked out Barkley Microphones, it is certainly worthwhile. It's a great ribbon microphone uh, at a value price. Um, so the sound office is about approach to sound, and we've already talked about that, uh, you know, in terms of like your, your personal approach to sound. Um, 
but if you know you you because you are an educator uh, mm -hmm. how do you impart uh to your students uh a practical way and tactical way of, of uh, improving their sound quality? Um, I believe it starts with uh, spending time to preparing some repertoire, right? Um, there's several etudes and um, uh, concertos and uh, works that you can spend time learning that will help you understand how your sound reacts in different, level, different ranges. Um, and then recording yourself as well. Um, I mean, better sound production comes with a greater level of consistency of practice. You won't know what to fix until you've tried something for a period of time or approach something for a particular time with level of consistency um, to even understand what direction to go in with your sound or what, or with your equipment even, or so all those things stem from a consistent routine of practice and a consistent um, uh, approach to preparing repertoire. Um, and I think over time you start to understand what, what, what your sound is and what your sound wants to be and listening to music. I mean, a lot of people, a lot, it's amazing. I talked to some of my students, they don't even have a favorite, artists that they uh, aspire to sound like. Um, and I'm not saying that you should make your sound sound like a particular person, but maybe there's a sound quality you like. Oh, I like the, that, the warmth of that sound. I like the, the resonance of that sound. Like the chord. So you have to have a concept in your mind about where you want to get to. And then through preparing repertoire, you start to understand what direction you're going and recording yourself and listening back and saying, oh, okay. I understand. And we had the technology to do that. When I was coming up, I had to use a cassette deck, which, you know, when the batteries start going dead, you go start going flat. And, oh, man. So anyway, that's a whole lot. But yeah, I think okay. that's, that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, next segment is Geared Up. And uh, Geared Up is brought to us by Venture Mouthpieces, uh, Venture, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. Use the code TrumpetGurus21 to get 10% off your order. Uh, and uh, Geared Up is about gear. And uh, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, your work with uh, KO with uh, Stombi. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if you think about equipment, and equipment being that interface between uh, the the player and the music, um, what kind of uh, what kind of advice do you give people in terms of approaching their selection of gear? Mm. Well, I think a lot of times we uh, or young younger players they they see another player playing on a particular horn, you know, they, they and they say, "Oh, I got to play on that because so and so plays on that." And yes, that can be true to a certain extent that, that that horn might work ideally for you. But ultimately, once again, the, the trumpet is such a psychosomatic instrument in that how we feel definitely affects how we perform on the instrument. Feeling in terms of, you know, um, physically and does the horn resonate in our hands? Do we, do we, are we getting some feedback from the horn? whether it's through a level of back pressure or what, is it too much, is it too little? So you have to understand what you, kind of what you want out of the horn. Is the horn, does the horn play in tune? When you play your warm-up routine, does it feel like it's responding to that warm-up routine well? So it goes back to what we were talking about before, consistency. If you don't have a consistent approach on what you want to sound, you could go down a rabbit hole and just be trying horns and hopefully, and maybe, or never find what you're looking for. Um, there's so many choices out there now um, that, um, especially for younger players that are coming up, if they come from an intermediate horn, any professional level horn will probably feel a lot better than what they're playing on now for the most part. And then once they get to that next level, this is mostly, you know, probably college age students or, student, you know, an advanced level, that are starting to play more regularly and build a level of consistency and understand what their strengths and weaknesses are, then they're going to have to spend a little more time searching for that for that horn. I, I'm a big fan of bringing someone to listen, someone that has played with you, 
bring someone to listen to you play on a particular horn when you go shopping, your teacher even, um, or a, a colleague. And, and, and combined with what the sound is and how you feel about it, how it responds to what you do, I think that'll help you make a good decision, an educated decision um, where you want to go. Good stuff. I, you know, I actually uh, was thinking that I needed to add a, an extra uh, episode or an extra segment on the show, which was on uh, gear, uh, not just the, the, the gear, but the, the gear that you wear um, and uh, make sure. Oh. That <laughs> Psycho bunny, because <laughs> man, yeah, because you, I'm, I'm actually a little disappointed today because uh, you usually have like the sexy shirts on, and I, I had to bust out something. I little. do, I know, I know. I was, it's funny, you know. So, so that being said, too. So, I'm obviously, I'm in my home, you know, my home studio, or whatever. And I just came, I, I came back from doing my wife and I do our, our walk around Franklin Park, and, uh, and. Um, and yeah, I was all sweaty and everything like that. I was like, oh man, I, I, I got to do this podcast. I got to change. So I put on my t-shirt. I didn't want to put on my Robert Graham. That's what I, that's what I normally wear is my, my Bobby G's, man. I know I let you down, man. I let you down. I'm sorry. Oh, but, but that's, but, but we can speak to that. I mean, in terms of attire and I mean, that's, I mean, yes, obviously when, when, you know, I'm playing in an ensemble and it's, and, and it's basic black or whatever, you know, it's all black. But, you know, I, st I think it's important for us as artists to, that's important too, to wear comfortable, well-fitting, good quality clothes when we're performing. That too assists in how we play the instrument. Yeah, I have a, you know, I have all black that I wear for where it's a wedding band gig or a corporate gig. I just did a gig in Martha's Vineyard. It was fun, you know, all black. You got to wear stuff that's comfortable. You're standing on your feet for four hours, you know, maybe invest in some quality shoes. I mean, th these days you can wear those hybrid Cole Haan shoes. Um, I have the Echo, the hybrid Echo shoes that I wear for these things, nice black, you know, but, they, but they're comfortable and, they're clean. you know, th these days I've got great fabrics. And this is the thing too, it's interesting. I'm a big guy and a big tall guy, you know, and I'm always like, I'm like cats that can buy stuff off the rack. I, I'm like, you have no excuse to not look right. If I can look good at six, three, 300 pounds and dress right, you got no excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, but little things like, and this goes to, and maybe this is another segment, but how you present yourself will also help you get called for gigs. And maybe this is a, this is a music business talk that I give, but you know, yeah, if you got ill-fitting, trousers go to the tailor and get them hemmed right if you've got a jacket that's falling apart you can go to men's warehouse and get something on sale for 39 dollars. and quite honestly if you can't afford to afford to invest in yourself and things like that that are going to present you in a good positive light why should i hire you yeah exactly Exactly, man. I, you know, we, I mean, we, I, I'm not even trying. It's just not a matter of whether, oh, well, if you can't afford it. I'm like, well, you can't afford not to afford it. Yeah. <laughs> you, I, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying the guy come out in the tux and pay five, five, eight hundred dollars for a suit or whatever. There is a lot. It's just a matter of being put together right. Yeah. And I think, and this goes to a bigger issue, which is not just about trumpet, but just musicians in general and artists. Um, I just finished up an arts management degree at UMass. Um, and because I feel like so many artists don't understand how to present themselves from a branding standpoint. There's a mm -hmm. reason why the average person thinks that being a musician is just a hobby. It's because a lot of times we don't go out looking right. We don't look right on stage. We look sloppy. We're not put together right. We're not presenting ourselves in a manner that suggests a level of professionalism. Mm -hmm. So to your point, I like, I, I'm flattered that you realize that, yeah, I'm the, it's, I joke around with my buddy, Niles Thomas, we have a uh, company in, 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 uh, in Las Vegas, Jazz Republic. 
I'm the guy that wears the shirts. I'm the, I, that's what I'm known for. I, I that's what I do. I invest in those shirts, and they're not cheap. But I mean, there's you know, I like to I like to wear cool shirts. Yeah. So I that is a very flattering comment. Thank you, Jose. And I next time we do this, I will not let you down, man. All right, man. I, and I will bust out my Bobby G too because I, I definitely right. cause a fool. Right. I love those, man. I love those shirts. Yeah, I just want to look like Jens Lindemann. So <laughs> he's like, "Did you buy my signature shirt yet?" I'm like, "No." I'm not paying six hundred dollars for that thing. No, man. Yeah, love yeah. you, mean it, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not my color palette. Rashawn, Rashawn too. Rashawn's a Bobby G guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and he's, yeah, he's got, he's got, you know, he's big time. He's got that big time, you know, okay. Bobby G signature shirt. I like that. I'm, I'm happy for him. That's awesome. Well, I, you know, it's funny because yeah, I most of the playing I do is is uh, this corporate Yankee like, Bank Gates wedding, yeah. and I just made an investment. This is a complete aside, folks, uh, but. Trust me, if you do a lot of gigs, like, you know, like long, long gigs, not like just like, you know, big money, Bijan right. here, uh, <laughs> working stuff like me, um, my back sometimes just killing me by the end of a gig. Got to get those shoes, man. You got to spend, oh. Not just the shoes, bro. Not oh. the shoes. I invested in a mat, a standing mat that you like for. Oh, for, yeah. I, just, I didn't even think about that. Got one from Amazon, man. It's like twenty. I didn't by, even think about that. Four by twenty, something. Yeah. Like that. Oh, I played a gig on one Saturday. Oh, I'm gonna try that, man. Okay. I I I felt great. I felt yeah, because I can fit that. I I fit that in my. I have like a rolling bag that I bring to my. You know. Yeah. These I, gigs, it can fit in there. It rolls up, right? No, not this one. No, this was this is the. I, it's a pretty it, thick one. A pretty thick one, huh? Yeah. Yes, it's like maybe about yay thick. Oh, okay. Memory foam. It's yeah, we have one in the kitchen, and I know we have a thick one. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's different from those. It's it's thicker. It's designed for really. Stations. You don't have to hit me to that, man. Send me send me a link to that, bro. I tell you what, I put in the in the show notes. So anybody who wants to check this, <laughs> okay. out, I'm telling you, it it is a lifesaver. I'm gonna have to check that out because I just did a gig. Like I said, I was standing on my feet for four and a half hours, man. It almost took me out. I mean, even with my nice shoes and everything, it took me out. Yeah, like, all, all the little things, man. So it's, it's all gear. It's Thank all you. Gear. See, see, right. you learn something every day, man. I love it. I love all it. Right. Final segment, and this is brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies. Robinson's yes. Remedies, rapid relief for those sore and tired chops. This is Robinson's Remedy rapid fire rounds. A series of questions that goes all over the place. Uh, so. Even though you don't have your Bobby G with you today, lip renew. I got my lip renew in me though. Oh man, that, that stuff is. Have you tried the lip quench yet? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. But yeah. I use the um the other one. It's in my case. Recovery um, stick. The, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, yeah, that one. Recovery stick. That, recovery. That. Yeah, that the little uh, ointment. Yeah. Oh, and man. and the lotion, the the hand lotion. Oh yeah. That is on point. In fact, I got to talk to my man. I'll probably I'll see him next week in San Antonio. I will I'll tell him to send some my way too. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> like I gotta get the my, 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 my wife stole my bottle. And <laughs> so, it works great, man. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those guys are they they're on they're on to something, man. They they and you know it's interesting. So my friend's a drummer and he's like, I don't see what the big deal is this. I'm like, bro, you when you go, you know, he lives in Newbury, he lives in Newbury Park, California. So it's like, yeah, no, you know, there's no weather to speak yeah. of. Well, like, trust me, when you play trumpet and you put that in your face and you can, man, shoot. And the lotion is killing. Yeah. yeah. And the soap, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, wait, I'm waiting. Yes, I'm, I, I, I am. And Dorsey, I, gotta, I, I owe them some headshots and stuff. So I got I to gotta get on that. That's on me. Yeah, well. Try to get on there. Absolutely, folks. If you have not tried Robinson's with any of the products. Try them all. Try them all, man. You you will you will be one hundred percent sold. I guarantee. Guarantee. Yeah. All right. If not, ask Bijan for your money back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Come find me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll roll. We'll roll Walter White in the, the alley and get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this was our, our rapid fire round. So, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Watson, are you ready, my friend? Uh oh, here we go. All right, let's hit it. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? That is not a trumpet player. It's not a trumpet player. Oh my goodness. Wow, you you hit me with the other stuff here. Um biggest influence on my life. Uh 
Oh my gosh. Okay, wait a minute. Let's back up. So, like, in terms of anything, anything on your life, man, that's too broad of a question. Um, okay, biggest influence. And it's a person that's not a trumpet player. Person, yeah, person not a trumpet player. Um, wow, you stuck me. See, right out the gate, man. Wow, you got me, man. Um, there's so many people, man. Uh, biggest influence. Um, my wife. Well, that's, uh, now you can sleep at night. <laughs> Safely. <laughs> you can close both eyes. Oh, that's not, a, okay, it's not a Troy player. Um, see, I'm going to get in trouble because it's a combination. Probably, I, I was going to say John Clayton. Because without him, I wouldn't be in this situation where I'm in right now, advocating for me. So I, I'm going to ch change my answer. John Clayton. All right. We'll, we'll take All right. And, and we'll, 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 we'll accept it. I mean, that, that's a no, man. That, that's not even in, in question, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, What is your favorite book? Oh, wow. Um, my favorite book, The 5 a.m. Club by Robin Sharma. All right. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Worst. <laughs> uh, Battlefield Earth. Yeah, you, you, I'm a science fiction guy, and that that was pretty bad. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. My wife still gives me grief over that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? A uh, real estate investor. Well, I kind of am already. I do that already. Uh, if I wasn't a trumpet player, what would I want to be? Um, restaurant owner. Sounds good to me. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh, bourbon old fashioned. Ooh. Okay. With extra Lusardo cherries. Ah. Uh. There you go. Talking my language there. Uh, you could have a dinner party and invite any three people in the entire world. Any three living people could come to your party. Who would you want to have there? Any three living people. Uh, Barack Obama. Um, three living people. Um, ah, living, I was going to say living. Let's see, who else would I invite? Um, wow, man. You got some, these are some good questions. What you think? Yeah, you're doing this. This is why you got your own show. Yeah. Uh, Barack, <laughs> Barack Obama, I would say, um, Warren Buffett. And uh hmm. The Rock. Oh, okay. All right. Got a got a powerhouse dinner table there. Mm -hmm. All right. We got three additional chairs there, and they can be occupied by any three people from history, three people that are no longer with us. Mm. Let's see. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., for sure. I'd like to pick his brain. Uh, hmm. From history. <sighs> hmm. Wow, man, you're good at this. Nelson Mandela. All right. And 
Uh, let's see, who else? Wow. Um, wow, another person from history. Uh, let's say, Sorry, I'm slowing down your lightning segment. Sorry, right, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much lightning anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, how about... Uh... Wow, man. Um, Louis Armstrong. Okay, Pops. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's a good one. All right. All right, this, this should be an easier one. Lacquer, plated, or raw? Um, plated. All right. What is your favorite quote? You create your own reality. That's philosopher Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. What is your greatest fear? Not uh, completing my goals. All right. You could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Mm. Uh, one superpower. Um, mm. One superpower. I, I know you already got like 30 of them. So, so, so what we just want. <laughs> Um, probably, um, uh, endurance, extra, uh, 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 extra endurance. All right. That's what we got Robinson Germany's for. Uh, so, uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Hmm. Overrated. Um, range. All right. And what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Range, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> the most underrated, I think, is uh, intonation. Okay. Uh, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Go back in time, one advice. Um, uh, let's see. Transcribe more music. All right. While you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Mm. Learn how to say no to things. Except for this podcast. Except for this. And, and a final question for you. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, I definitely want a legacy to be of mentorship and uh, uh, known for sharing uh, my ideas and time about art, uh, about being creative artists and about music to anyone that's interested. I don't turn anyone away. If they have, a, when, you know, I, I feel it's a privilege and an honor to be asked to give people lessons if they want, if they want, want to get somewhere and, or if they want a different perspective on things. Um, so I, I'd like to be known as, uh, you know, the, my legacy of, uh, of mentorship and, so, and uh, being supportive and positive. Hmm. Well, you are certainly certainly living up to that uh, expectation for yourself. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, this has been a complete joy for me to uh, get to know you better. Uh, Likewise, man. We'll have to do it over uh, further uh, uh, over some uh, old fashions. Uh, yes, I am definitely a, a lover of the old fashions, the new fashions, any fashions. So, uh, <laughs> but no, it, it, it's been great, man. Uh, you have, you. You, you have the, the spirit of, uh, that you know exudes confidence 
and uh, inspiration. So, you know, I, I really applaud you for all your hard work. And uh, if you want to learn more about Bijan and what he's got going on and uh, connect with him, please check the show notes. Uh, we'll have contact information for you there. And uh, I'm looking forward to the your your signature uh, Robert Graham shirt, uh, hopefully in the future. Uh, I'll hook you up with one, man. All right. Well, I'll definitely I'll definitely sport it. It's got some purple in it, man, because that's my jam. That's right. right. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do that. That's where we roll, man. All right. So thank you very much for spending time with us today for Trump Producers Hang. Make sure that you like, subscribe, share, tell tell your friends all about this stuff, man. And uh, we love you. Until next time. Peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group.